This hearing is called to order. Today's hearing will enable us to conduct a comprehensive examination of the significant reforms the Coast Guard has made to its acquisition management policies and procedures. I note that this hearing is being conducted as one of several hearings that meet the oversight requirements under Clause 2N, O, and P of Rule 11 of the Rules of the House of Representatives. In the past, the subcommittee and indeed the full Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure have looked in great detail at the Coast Guard's $24 billion deep water acquisitions, which comprise the largest single acquisition series the Coast Guard has undertaken in history. In the 110th Congress, the subcommittee held two hearings directly on deep water and an additional hearing that focused in part on deep water. The full committee held an 11-hour investigative hearing to examine the failure of the effort to lengthen the 110-foot patrol boats to 123 feet, a project uh, which was implemented through one of the first delivery orders issued under the deep water IDIQ. Without a doubt, the deep water program is a poster child illustrating how not to dis design, manage, and contract a major acquisition effort. By the Coast Guard's own account, at the time the service signed the first deep water contract, its acquisition management capability lagged behind its expanded operational requirements and was in no way equal to the rapid growth that occurred in its capital budget after 9-11. The service lacked standardized acquisition processes. It lacked a collaborative and proven process to guide the generation of asset requirements, designs, and acquisition strategies. And it had only limited acquisition management capability among its staff. Additionally, the Coast Guard intentionally removed deep water from those established acquisition management practices that it did have in place, further limiting the oversight that the service was prepared to exercise when it, when it initiated that program. In an effort to move ahead with what were and what unquestionably remain critical acquisitions to replace its aging assets, the Coast Guard decided to follow the lead of the Department of Defense and hire a private firm to serve as lead systems integrator. Without adequate oversight, including mechanisms for requiring and measuring performance, the lead systems integrator essentially took the Coast Guard for a ride. This same pattern also occurred on the Rescue 21 project, which is being built to improve the service's ability to locate mariners in distress. On that project, a different private sector entity serving as lead systems integrator took the Coast Guard for another ride that has resulted in substantial cost overruns and extended scheduled delays. The original acquisition baseline for the Rescue 21 project was adopted on April 16, 1999. At that time, the system was, system was projected to cost $250 million, and the acquisition was projected to be completed in fiscal year 2006. The baseline for this project has now been revised five times and the estimated cost to complete the system is by 2017 is nearly now $1.1 billion. In other words, we went from $250 million to $1.1 billion. Something is awfully wrong with that picture. Fortunately, I do believe that under the leadership of Commander Thad Allen, the Coast Guard is retaking the wheel and developing the processes and systems that will enable it to effectively manage its own acquisition efforts. The purpose of our hearing today is to assess the Coast Guard's readiness to drive. I emphasize that we are not here to look backward. Investigations of the past now properly reside with the federal entities that are apparently examining whether any laws were broken in the, broken in the past procurements. The Coast Guard has responded to the extensive criticisms of the early deep water effort and the Rescue 21 program by creating a new acquisitions directorate. 
issuing and, continued, and continuing to revise a blueprint for acquisition reform, which guides the acquisition management systems it is building and extracting deep water from the IG, ICGS team and bringing the lead systems integrated functions back in-house. Today's hearing is intended to enable us to understand whether these steps are adequate to correct what the Coast Guard has identified as its past acquisition management challenges and to prepare itself to manage what will likely be more than $1 billion in annual acquisition efforts for years to come. We also want to understand what challenges remain unresolved, what steps the Coast Guard is taking to resolve them, and whether the Coast Guard has the resources it needs to build the acquisition management systems it envisions. In a memorandum issued earlier this month announcing new efforts to improve the federal government's management of its contracting efforts, President Barack Obama noted, quote, it is essential that the federal government have the capacity to carry out robust and thorough management and oversight of its contracts in order to achieve programmatic goals, avoid significant overcharges, and curb wasteful spending, end of quote. It is among the highest priorities of this subcommittee to ensure that the Coast Guard meets this basic standard and that, as President Obama has said, it can perform its acquisition functions efficiently and effectively while ensuring that its actions result in the best value for the taxpayers. To that end, to that end I've worked with the chairman of the full committee, Chairman Oberstar, the ranking member of the full committee, Congressman Micah, and our distinguished subcommittee ranking member, Congressman Labiando, to draft the Coast Guard Acquisition Reform Act of 2009, H.R. 1665, which would build on the reforms the Coast Guard has already implemented. Specifically, the legislation would bar the Coast Guard's use of a private sector lead system integrator by September 30, 2011. It would require the appointment of a chief acquisition officer who, at the Commandant's choice, can be either a civilian or military officer, but who must be a Level 3 certified program manager and have at least 10 years of professional experience in acquisition management. And it would require the appointment of the Level 3 certified program managers to manage the Coast Guard's largest acquisitions. Additionally, the legislation would uh, formalize procedures intended to ensure that the service effectively defines operational requirements before initiating acquisition efforts. That trade, <clears throat> that trade offs among performance, costs, and schedule are understood and assessed for each acquisition, and that all assets undergo thorough development and operational testing to ensure that they meet all contractual requirements and pose no safety risks to Coast Guard personnel. I emphasize that this legislation is intended to institutionalize best practices within the Coast Guard and to ensure that the service develops and maintains the expertise within its workforce that it will need to effectively and efficiently implement all acquisition efforts it undertakes in the future. With that, I recognize the distinguished ranking member, Congressman Labiando, for his opening remarks and thank him and also for his staff and his staff and members for their work with me and Chairman Oberstar on H.R. 1665. Mr. Labiando. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, calling this hearing to continue the subcommittee's efforts to oversee the Coast Guard's acquisition programs, and in particular, the Deepwater Program. In the time that has passed since the subcommittee's last hearing on this topic in June of 07, the Coast Guard has made substantial changes to its acquisition program. These changes are designed to enhance the service's capabilities to manage multi-billion dollar programs, including the responsibility of assuming lead system integration duties for all current and future acquisitions. The Coast Guard is operating the third oldest fleet in the world. That's right, the third oldest fleet in the world. Everyone agrees that we must replace and modernize the service's aging vessels, aircraft, and communication systems. Right now, the men and women of the Coast Guard are conducting oper operations at higher tempos than ever before aboard vessels that are incapable of supporting their critical missions. This is not sustainable, nor is it acceptable. 
I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about what more is needed to help the Coast Guard bring new and enhanced assets on board. The subcommittee has the responsibility to oversee the service's efforts to acquire the most appropriate assets in a timely manner and at the best value to the American taxpayer. Toward that end, Chairman Cummings introduced legislation today which follows on numerous discussions between the majority, the minority, and the service. And Mr. Chairman, I especially want to thank you and your staff for your tremendous level of cooperation and reaching out to us on so many important issues involved with this legislation. I believe this bill will provide the authorities and the guidance necessary to support acquisition of these badly needed assets. And again, I welcome Admiral Ballore for what might be his last hearing as Assistant Commandant of Acquisition. Admiral, you have done a great job to steady the acquisition wheel over the past few years, and we wish you the best in your new position as District 13 Commander in Seattle. I also look forward to hearing from the GAO and their ongoing efforts to oversee the Coast Guard acquisitions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Before we hear from our first witness, I ask unanimous consent that Henry Brown, a member of the full committee, may submit a statement for the record and without objection is so ordered. I also note that today is the 20th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez disaster and thus of the Coast Guard's largest single pollution response. We'll now hear from Mr. McMahon for an uh, opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, ironically, as we mark the 20th anniversary uh, of the Exxon Valdez, we had a minor, relatively minor spill uh, in, the, in the waters uh, off of Staten Island uh, near the uh, ferry landing. Uh, and hopefully that will be uh, contained. Uh, maybe we can ask the Coast Guard about that later on. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman and Rear Admiral Bloor. Uh, and Ms. Hutton for your testimony this morning. Our Coast Guard is critically important for our nation's port se security and the safe rescue of so many at sea. Since the tragic day in September 2001, our world has changed, not only in my home city of New York, but for all of us. The lessons from that tragedy have forced us to address the growing threats to our nation from land, air, and sea. And to handle this change, we have so often relied on the Coast Guard and the bravery of, of the men and women who are with the Coast Guard to watch our shores and protect the homeland. The hardworking men and women of the Coast Guard have also worked together with our law enforcement and harbor patrols to provide a coordinated response to emergencies at sea. Perhaps the latest and most noteworthy example of this coordinated response was the effort undertaken by all of you in the Coast Guard to assist U.S. Airways Flight 1549 after it was forced to make an emergency landing in the Hudson River in January. No doubt the quick and coordinated response by the Coast Guard and regional ferry services saved many lives that day. And I commend you for your hard work in that emergency and in all that you do. So we all understand just how important the Coast Guard is to our national security and our safety of our rivers, harbors, and oceans. But acknowledging the critical role of the Coast Guard, we must also recognize that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that our acquisition and procurement policies are in line with our high expectations of the department. As most of you know, I am still relatively new to this committee, so I have not personally witnessed the evolution of all the problems with the deep water program to upgrade our surface and air assets and the other procurement challenges facing the Coast Guard. Uh, but I do know that the American people deserve to have a Coast Guard that has provided the best and most up-to-date equipment that is paid for by money that is spent wisely and efficiently. With ships, planes, and helicopters costing hundreds of millions of dollars, we need to keep a very, very close watch on how this money is being spent. I commend Chairman Cummings and the leadership of this subcommittee in addressing these procurement problems head on. And I also commend our witnesses for their role in working through these very challenging logistical problems on the ground in these agencies. The issues may not always generate attention-grabbing headlines, but this oversight is some of the most important work that we do here uh, in this committee. I know that my constituents have no tolerance for taxpayer money wasted because of bureaucratic inefficiency, outdated and duplicative procurement reviews, or poor interdeterminal communication, inter interdepartmental communication. So I'm glad that we are here addre today addressing the important issue and providing key congressional oversight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Coble for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I've got two other meetings, so I may be coming and going, but I appreciate you and Mr. Lobiata calling this hearing, Mr. Chairman, 
uh, it is my belief that it is important that we continue to exercise oversight of deep water. We do so to ensure that the men and women of the Coast Guard get the equipment that they so obviously deserve and need. Furthermore, I think we owe the taxpayers answers on how the, the federal dollars are being utilized. I believe the men and women of the Coast Guard, Mr. Chairman, you've heard me say it before, provide the taxpayer with the great return on our investment. We get more bang for the buck through the Coast Guard, in my opinion, than with any other federal entity. Deepwater assets should complement their dil diligence and dedication. I'd also like to reiterate that we cannot lose sight of the purpose of deep water, which is to provide the men and women of the Coast Guard with the tools to protect our nation. I applaud the actions taken by Admiral Allen, the Commandant, and the entire Coast Guard family to move this acquisition program in the right direction and look forward to, uh, Mr. Chairman, to hearing the, an update on this important acquisition. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. I want to thank you, Mr. Coble. Um, let me just go back to something that you said, Mr. Coble, and you, Ms. McMahon. Um, we, uh, the, the committee, uh, as you well know, Mr. Coble, uh, we have, uh, we basically had three objectives in dealing with, in addressing the deep water uh, program. Uh, we certainly wanted the, the Coast Guard to have the equipment that it needed to do its job. But there were two other things that we wanted too. We wanted to make sure that the people of this great country uh, got what they bargained for. I mean, just a simple concept, but we really meant that. And the other thing uh, that we uh, wanted to make sure was that whatever equipment we purchased did no harm to our own personnel. Uh, and that those, when you put those three things together, they were the guiding principles uh, that have uh, gotten us to the point that we are today. And I, and I think our entire committee uh, adopted those and, and the Coast Guard has too. And I think that's why we have made the progress that we've made so far. Let me just um, now uh, welcome Admiral Gary Bloor. Admiral Bloor is the Assistant Commandant for Acquisition of the United States Coast Guard. And he is indeed uh, largely responsible for many of the changes uh, that have been made. I want to thank you, Admiral, for your sensitivity, for your cooperation in working with, with us so that we could get to the point that we are today. You've been an extremely dedicated a member of the Coast Guard and certainly in this responsibility you took it on very seriously and I know gave it your very best which is a whole lot and um, he, the jury is still out as we could tell from the, the uh, GAO report but I think that we're well on our road well on the road to where we've got to go and so uh, again welcome and we will now hear from you I'm sorry Ms. Richardson did you have an opening statement very well. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss the Coast Guard's ongoing and much needed recapitalization projects. As the Coast Guard's Assistant Commandant for Acquisition, I am accountable to the Commandant, this committee, and the American taxpayer to ensure each of our major acquisition projects are developed, executed, and successfully completed to meet mission requirements. In his recent State of the Coast Guard address, our Commandant spoke about the strength of our reformed acquisition organization and the Coast Guard's integrated approach to completing major projects. Admiral Allen pointed out that Coast Guard acquisition has been informed by our past actions and we have made appropriate corrections, stating, today we are in a new place and it needs to be recognized. Since 2006, the Coast Guard has taken a holistic look at mission support. One of the first areas was consolidation and reform of our acquisition directorate. This effort was part of a service-wide restructuring of our business efforts in acquisition, engineering, logistics, and human resources. Together with the other directorates and with congressional support, we will create a comprehensive mission support organization that will unify and standardize business practices. In the interest of time, let me highlight just a few of our projects. We have commissioned the first national security cutter, Bertoff, which recently completed successful combat system qualifications with the United States Navy. The second and third national security cutters, Weishi and Stratton, are under construction, and a fourth has long lead materials on order. 
Today, our new response boat medium is delivering capability to the field, including one of the vessels that responded to the ditching of U.S. Air Flight 1549 in the Hudson River in January. The contract for the next 30 response boats was signed last evening, bringing the total number of contracted boats to 66. We have delivered seven Ocean Century Maritime Patrol aircraft, have four more on contract, and are converting all six C-130J aircraft with new sensor mission systems while we're doing dozens of helicopter upgrades. Rescue 21, our nearshore command control and communication systems, now provides enhanced coverage along more than 27,000 nautical miles of coastline. That system is saving lives today. The most poignant example of the success of our reformed acquisition processes is the contract award for our fast response cutter Sentinel class patrol boat. With a total potential contract value of more than $1 billion, it was a highly competitive process. Our award determination was deliberate, absolutely fair, and resulted in a best value decision for the government. A post-award protest was filed with the U.S. Government Accountability Office where our process and award determination were carefully and objectively reviewed. Our actions passed the review and the protest was denied. Another post-award protest was then filed with the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, where it was later withdrawn by the protester and dismissed with prejudice by the judge. Again, showing through an external and objective review the robust nature of today's Coast Guard acquisition process. I appreciate the support of this committee most recently described in its views and estimates letter for fiscal year 2010. Additionally, we have received strong support from the GAO and our department, including the Office of Inspector General. I believe our programs are well run today because we accept and are practicing eight fundamental cornerstones of a successful acquisition. We have instituted a system of checks and balances within the Coast Guard. We maintain Coast Guard final certification capabilities. We have a reliable standard reference for acquisition management. We have implemented a robust strategic blueprint. We are committed to transparency. We avoid duplication of effort through robust partnerships with the United States Navy and the Department of Homeland Security. We embrace third-party independent validation. And we value departmental oversight through DHS approval of milestone decisions. One of my major challenges is building our staff of trained, certified, and experienced acquisition professionals. I have excellent people, I just need more of them. Bringing in accredited acquisition professionals is as challenging to the Coast Guard as it is to other federal government agencies. The current demand is high, and in this area, we need parity with DOD's expedited hiring authorities. There are many challenges ahead, engineering, technical, business, and financial. However, I am confident that we have put in place an acquisition culture that will be able to meet and address those challenges successfully. Thank you for your continued support of the men and women who serve in the United States Coast Guard. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my oral statement be included in the congressional record, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. So ordered. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Uh, let me just ask you a few questions, and then we'll move on to our ranking member. Um, in April 2007, the Coast Guard announced a series of major changes to its acquisition processes. Among these was the announcement that the Coast Guard would assume the role as lead systems integrator for all deep water assets and other major acquisitions as appropriate. What is the status of the uh, Coast Guard's effort to serve as lead system integrator for deep water? Have all the lead systems integration functions for the deep water been bought completely within the Coast Guard? Thank you for the question, sir. Let, let me uh, divide the answer in the two parts, the actual lead system inter integrator contract and what we're performing in the Coast Guard. The uh, Congressional Research Service defines a lead system inter integrator as the entity responsible for requirements, testing, validation, logistics, post-delivery modification, and maintenance. The Coast Guard is the lead system integrator for all of our major acquisitions. Notwithstanding that, we still have two commercial contracts that are called commercial lead system integrator contracts. We don't issue delivery task orders under those contracts for lead system integrator functions anymore, but they still exist. Um, I know we have often said that we're moving towards ending the old lead system integrator relationship with integrated Coast Guard systems. 
Uh, I am pleased to notify the committee that as of this morning, we signed a bilateral agreement with ICGS, Integrated Coast Guard Systems, which says, I quote, the government has determined that it is in the best interest not to award any future award terms after January 24th, 2011. Therefore, by this modi modification, the parties agree that for the purpose of ordering any new contractual requirements, the rights and obligations of both parties will expire when this award term ends January 24th, 2011. So as of January 24th, 2011, that contract won't exist anymore. But in the meantime, we don't actually use it for LSI functions. Now, will the Coast Guard be fully prepared to perform uh, all the lead systems integration functions uh, by that date? Uh, we either will or will know where our weaknesses lie, and where our weaknesses lie, we'll use our partnerships with the United States Navy. There are areas that we need assistance, uh, such as cost estimate, estimate estimating, and independent government cost estimates are a good example. We don't have a lot of people that do that, but Naval Sea Systems Command and Naval Air Systems Command assist us on that. Mm -hmm. and, and tell me what we are doing to prepare either our own people in the Coast Guard or looking at civilians to do that. In other words, um, I assume there comes a point where you don't want to have to rely, you want to be able to rely on uh, the Coast Guard or its civilian personnel. So I'm just, what, what, is that the aim in the end? Or, and if so, what are we doing to make that happen? Uh, we have a variety of programs underway, sir, both civilian and military. Um, it is not our aim to become like the Naval Sea Systems Command or Air Systems Command. We're not that large. It is our aim to have certain organic core capabilities within the Coast Guard and use our sister service uh, so that we don't duplicate their efforts where that's uh, appropriate. Uh, we do have a certification program that we've really enhanced over the last two and a half years. Uh, I think we've issued a, over 240 certifications for both military and civilian personnel after documenting the appropriate experience and training. Uh, we'll continue to promote a quasi-career path for military personnel and we'll continue to hire civilians uh, to the extent the marketplace will let us. The Congress has allowed us growth for the last two years within our acquisition core, and I think as long as we can maintain growth for the next couple of years, we, we will be in good stead, sir. Just one, one other thing. Um, as discussed, the deep water program acquisition baseline expects the program to cost $24 billion to complete. However, it appears that all of the projects considered to be a part of deep water when combined with the acquisition activities that are part of deep water, such as the program management costs, systems engineering and technology, obsolescence prevention programs, are currently, are currently estimated to cost more than $26 billion. And we're going from 24 to, to $26 billion. A particular concern is the fact that the costs associated with the deep water, with deep water have risen as a cost of the individual acquisition, such as the NSC, uh, as you well are aware, that is risen. What will be the cost to complete the acquisitions that are part of the original deep water procurements? And what will that ultimately be, if you have an estimate? If these are not expected to grow beyond $24 billion, what plan acquisitions will not be undertaken, or what changes will be made to uh, currently planned acquisitions to get the cost down to that $24 billion because it seems like we are definitely on a pattern to go far above the original 24. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I've committed to uh, always have absolute full disclosure with uh, our oversight committee. Um, as was mentioned uh, earlier, I think, in your opening statement, we have started doing our acquisition program baselines which is the basic fundamental document for cost estimates over the next 20 or 25 years, asset by asset. We have seven of those new asset uh, APBs approved. We have seven in progress of approval. They're all up at the department. And we have five that are still in the pre-acquisition phase, and that should add, add up to our 19 major projects. If you add up the individual APBs that are approved with the old estimates from Deepwater, you are absolutely correct. It adds up to $26 billion. Um, that's based on our independent cost estimates of today. 
We will update that annually. Uh, the other caution I would say in using that number is twofold. One, we are trying to estimate over 20 to 25 years the nature of the strength of the dollar, exchange rates, labor rates, et cetera, and also the offshore patrol cutter, which is the single largest project we have, is still at its old estimates because that one's still in its pre-acquisition phase. That's a third of that total estimate it represents. So, you know, as of today, based on our best estimates, the entire deep water program as it was originally envisioned would add up to $26 billion, including the necessary government oversight, uh, technology obsolescence replacement, all the things that should be part of a well-run acquisition program, but that is what it adds up to. So you're just saying we're going to need more money? If you continue, if, unless the offshore patrol cutter comes in at a lower amount than we think, or there's major changes in the economy, uh, for example, when we did these estimates, the commodities market was about as high as it's gotten. It's actually come down since then. Um, that would be the estimate for completion. So you're right, we would have to make some hard decisions, you know, probably 15 or 16 years from now on how we would continue the projects if um, Congress decided not to appropriate more money. Mr. Labiano. Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Admiral, uh, in 07, the Coast Guard announced that it would assume the lead system integrator duties for the Deepwater Program, and since that time, the service has established an acquisition directorate and has sought to bolster its acquisition and personnel capabilities. Uh, do you anticipate retaining the lead system integrator position as you make the transition to a more uh, traditional asset-by-asset -asset replacement uh, project? Yes, sir, absolutely. We will not be using commercial system integrators, lead system integrators in the, in the future. We don't envision that. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you would coordinate, coordinate systems like C4 ISR, which spread across different asset classes? Yes, sir. I think one of the things, uh, if you go back to the early deep water program in 2002, 2003, is, is we, I believe, my opinion, underappreciated the capabilities that the Coast Guard had. And while they weren't robust and we need to increase our bench strength, uh, we have formalized our relationship with what we call our technical authorities, one of which is the assistant commandant for information or command control communications, C4ISR. And that technical authority has now assumed that role as kind of the systems integrator, the government personnel for the C4SR overlay. So although we're doing asset by asset uh, acquisitions, we are looking at it from a systems approach to make sure they're all integrated. But we use our technical authorities for that now as opposed to using a commercial lead system integrator. Thank you. Uh, can you give us any update on where the government stands on the investigation of the failure of the 123s, the conversion? I, yes, sir. Um, the uh, Department of Justice asked for an extension in a federal court um, to continue their investigation. Um, the judge did not grant the extension, uh, which meant the Department of Justice either had to intervene at that point or not intervene. The Department of Justice has chose to continue to do the investigation. Um, the judge's decision just allowed certain rights to be extended to the party that originally filed the um, uh, assertion of fraud. So the Department of Justice investigation continues. We're still fully cooperating with the Department of Justice. I still believe that the opportunity of any funds recovered to the government has a much higher probability of going the Department of Justice route, notwithstanding it may be longer than other means, but I believe it will be the most successful means. So Department of Justice continues their investigation. But if the uh, Department of Justice declines to move forward, would the Coast Guard move forward to recoup for the taxpayers? Yes, sir. Thank you. We have not given up any of our rights under uh, contract administration uh, to pursue recovery. Uh, I think the Department of Justice authorities are uh, more robust, which is why we choose to use the Department of Justice. But if they elect not to continue, since we revoked acceptance of the 123 patrol boats, then we will re-engage our contracting officers and seek recovery under administrative procedures. Okay, thank you. And uh, one last area, I know we're, we're talking about acquisition a lot, and there's uh, a lot of competition and it's tough to get experienced people. Do you have the authorities necessary to offer the salaries and incentives to attract quality uh, or the qualified personnel to the Coast Guard for this, for this area? 
We, we generally have most of what we need, sir, and, and we'd be pleased to provide something for the record to this committee. That the issue is having a level playing field. And when the market is so tight for acquisition professionals, you know, one slight advantage on the part of another agency and having, for example, direct hire authority um, can be hurtful to our interests. So we, we don't ask for anything different than anybody else has, but, but largely parity with the Department of Defense, which is normally who we're competing with in the job market. But if you'd allow us, we can certainly provide for the record what the, what the disparity is right now between Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Mr. Chairman, with your, with your permission, I think that would be helpful information for the committee to determine if the Coast Guard can compete in the marketplace. Yeah, I, you know, I was just thinking to, to myself, with all these people losing their jobs, it seemed like we'd be able to find some people who we would at least be able to train. I know, I know you know, acquisitions are, I mean, this is kind of unique, but I mean, when we've got with 600 and some thousand people losing their jobs every, every uh, a month, and many of them um, highly skilled people, I was just, I, I just, that question mark came into my mind. Not necessarily folk, uh, Mr. Labiano, who, like I said, who know th this particular type of acquisition uh, process, but certainly some folk who are, would be easy to train. I, I would just. Well, I, I certainly agree with you, but I also think um, what we may be hearing the Admiral say today and prior is that if the Navy or other branches of the military have uh, monetary incentives and an ability to attract top flight people that the Coast Guard doesn't, they're not looking for something that the Navy doesn't have, they're just looking to be on an equal playing field. Is that correct, Admiral? That, that's absolutely correct. And, and Mr. Chairman, we have a Department of Homeland Security intern program. We are trying to exploit that. It takes about four years to grow a fully qualified contracting officer and it can be as long as 10 years to get a level three program manager for acquisition. But we have a, a DHS intern program. We have a Coast Guard intern program. We're also looking to introduce a military retiree to contracting officer program because we have a lot of excellent military personnel that post-retirement will consider federal service and we'd like to try to retain those. So we're, I believe we're exploiting to about the maximum extent for the size of our organization internships um, but we certainly need to hire experienced personnel in the min meantime as we grow those new personnel. Mr. Labiano, now, now what was your inquiry? You were about well, to ask me something. No, just that uh, the Admiral provide us with a parity report so that we can decide if uh, I think it would be worthwhile to make sure that the Coast Guard has the same incentive capabilities as, so to speak, their other competitors and the other branches of the military so we can put them on a level playing field. Would you uh, be able to get us something to that effect? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. How soon? Uh, within two days. All right, thank you. And one of the things I just wanted to say to Mr. Labiando, the, the bill, 1665, has a expedited hiring authority um, provided with regard to uh, acquisition personnel. So, and so we, you know, there may be some other things we can do too. And if you have any other recommendations, by the way, with regard to the legislation, we might, might want to uh, hear what they, they are. Okay. Mr. Labiano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Blord, just to go back to a uh, question about C4ISR, could you quickly the, uh, review um, the, the current status of the acquisition strategy? Yes, sir. There, the, it's, you have to kind of take a look at it at two parts as the acquisition organization comes together. There was a, an original commercial lead system integrator developed C4ISR program for the deep water assets. One of the concerns of the Coast Guard from the very beginning is they only did the deep water assets. They didn't actually look at the larger Coast Guard. And then we had the other projects that were coming together. Our current C4ISR strategy, which we work very closely with our technical authority, the Assistant Commandant for C4ISR and his staff, is basically doing an integrated Coast Guard C4ISR strategy. So we don't care if it came from the Legacy Deepwater Program or if it's Response Boat Medium, which was not a Deepwater Program. All their electronics will operate together. They'll all use common protocols. They'll all understand each other's data rates. 
Um, and that's how we do it today, is really through our, uh, our own system integrator for C4ISR. In a little bit, we're going to be hearing from uh, Mr. Hutton from GAO, and the GAO report notes that um, while the asset-based approach is beneficial, certain cross-cutting aspects of deep water, such as C4ISR, and the overall numbers of each asset and to meet requirements still require a system level approach. The Coast Guard is not fully positioned to manage these aspects. Do you have a, a comment uh, on that? Well, yes, sir. I respectfully disagree that we're not quite there yet. I think we are there yet. We, we don't have a lot of depth. I would certainly agree with uh, Mr. Hutton on that, but we continue to grow that. We continue to partner with other agencies where we need the help. Uh, we are very aware of the idea that a systems approach for an organization that's trying to recapitalize so many assets at once is very important. Uh, we just don't agree that a systems approach has to be done as a systems acquisition. We think you can take a systems approach, define the requirements, and then it's much more manageable and the Coast Guard can have much better control and government oversight to purchase the things asset by asset but we'll still continue to use a systems approach. And we don't have a lot of bench strength, but we have enough for today. And we're, as I mentioned, in intern programs and other ways, we're growing it for tomorrow. Switch gears a little bit on deep water. Uh, the delays in the program have ca uh, caused the Coast Guard to rely more heavily on an aging cutter fleet. Have you all com uh, completed an analysis of the maintenance and life cycle or life extension costs required to keep those cutters operational? And and how, how's the Coast Guard, uh, does the Coast Guard have any other strategies other than intensive maintenance to keep those legacy assets uh, operational? Uh, we have done uh, life cycle cost estimates, uh, and, and with your permission, sir, I'll, I can provide those for the record. A lot of yeah. them come from our technical authority for engineering. Uh, along with extensive maintenance uh, and increased maintenance, we have the mission effectiveness program primarily for the surface fleet that takes our uh, medium endurance cutters, I think 17 of those, and 20 of our island class patrol boats, takes them through a very comprehensive uh, rejuvenation at our yard in Baltimore, and uh, will give those cutters many more years of service. And we absolutely need that program. It's been a very effective program for us because that's the only way you can make the two ends meet to allow for the new assets to come online while the old assets are extended or older assets. But it's the combination of that mission effectiveness program with increased maintenance in the fleet. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, those are all the questions I'll have. I'll yield back the balance of my time and look forward to meeting with uh, Admiral Bloor in a, in a few minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Plants. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have no question, just uh, thank the Admiral for his service and uh, his uh, testimony and information he shared with the committee in writing and uh, here today as well. Thank you. Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being with us, Admiral. Admiral, I've got to start with a concern. It sounds to me like you're going to break the deal on deep water after the program's over. And it sounds to me like you're putting together an acquisition force that probably won't be used for another generation. Why is there such a reluctance on the part of the Coast Guard to use the Navy uh, superintendent of shipbuilding? They buy ships every year. The Coast Guard has a major acquisition once a generation. And you're going to put together this force just in time for it not to be needed rather than, than, than smaller acquisitions. And I, I think that bears explaining. Yes, sir, and I appreciate the question. First off, there is no reluctance on our part to use the United States Navy. And, and again, we can provide for the record or now, if you'd prefer, the, the number of relationships we have with Navy organizations. We do use the superintend, uh, superintendent of shipping. All our project resident offices that are uh, in the fleet, um, for example, for the Sentinel patrol boat in uh, New Orleans, have generally representatives from the superintendent of shipping with them, especially that bring particular expertise that we don't, again, have a lot of bench strength on. So we have no reluctance to use them. I, I think I would submit that with the possible exception of the national security cutter, which is the closest thing that we have that looks like a naval combatant, that the Coast Guard does have unique requirements, that we understand those requirements best, and we're best served by a combination with the Navy as opposed to going to the Navy uh, for those assets. And especially as you get smaller into patrol boats, 
Um, I would submit we have more expertise in patrol boats than the Navy has. We operate many more patrol boats than they do. So we view it as a good team effort. Um, and we think our acquisition organization is going to be here for the next 20 or 25 years because we haven't talked about the 225-foot buoy tenders that in about five or six years we need to think about their replacement, the 175-foot buoy tenders, the inland buoy tenders. There's many other Coast Guard projects as we now take a long-range view of the next 30, 40, 50 years um, that we hope the committee would support to recapitalize the Coast Guard. Going back to the... Uh 123s. Who made the decision after the, the vessels had already been built at Bollinger, had been returned to Bollinger for some uh, changes that were hopefully going to prevent the hog getting sagging? Apparently, they, now, and walk me through where, where I'm wrong on this because it's been hard to get information from your organization. Apparently, after the modifications at Bollinger, they went back out to sea. They continue to have hogging and sagging problems, so they were brought to a, another shipyard. Instead of being returned for warranty work, and at the other shipyard, I'm told at least four of the vessels had the outer plating replaced. My question is, if you were, as an individual, had purchased a car, had problems with it, brought it back, and the dealer didn't fix it, I seriously doubt you would have gone to a second mechanic and said, fix it, while that vehicle was still under warranty. But that is apparently what you did for at least four of the 123s. Who made that call? Why? And what account did that money, that additional money that it took to have that work done, come out of? Yes, sir. I uh, understand the question. Um, there were two modifications made to the 123s after they came out of Bollinger. Modification one was done to all eight of the conversions. Modification two was done to four. Um, the reason that they were done outside of Bollinger um, was really the reality of the situation at the time. The original program was going to be 46 conversions. So as they came into Bollinger and were converted, they were exhausted from Bollinger and others were coming in behind them. So I think most of the decisions to do the mods outside of Bollinger were frankly just expediency. We didn't want to interrupt the line. This was before we decided to stop at number eight. And in fact, number eight's a good example because all the modifications for number eight are done at Bollinger because there's nothing else coming up the line. So there was no particular reason to do it in another yard. The first modification, which was done to all eight, was a bilateral agreement between the Coast Guard and Bollinger. The Coast Guard contributed roughly about $225,000 per hull, and Bollinger uh, provided about the equivalent of that. The second modification was uh, done to four of the cutters uh, in a hope to still fix the problem, which the first modification didn't. That was a unilateral decision by the Coast Guard, and it also cost roughly $225,000 per cutter and also failed to correct the problem. But going back to the basic premise, if, if you've got a, it's, it's my understanding that that vessel had about a one year warranty from the day of acceptance. So you're still under warranty. Why would you spend money, taxpayer money, that should have been paid for by Bollinger Shipbuilding? If you had a problem, why didn't you bring it back and say, fix it? I, I, I don't buy the capacity argument, Admiral. Because, I, I, number one, I think it was more than 200000 per vessel, although I've not seen any hard numbers, and I would welcome those numbers. But secondly is, okay, it's $200,000 times four. That's sneaking up on a million dollars. That should have come out of Bollinger's pocket instead of the taxpayer's pocket. The gentleman's time is up, but we would like to hear a response. Yes, sir. I'll provide the exact numbers for the record and when they were done and, and at which yard they were done. Uh, I'll review the uh, production capability of Bollinger at the time. I, again, this predates me, but I'm responsible for it. Okay, we'll I, get you the facts. I, but I would like a name of who made that decision. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Olson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral Bloor, thank you very much for coming here and testifying today. Greatly appreciate your service to our country, uh, and as a former naval aviator, I especially appreciate those gold wings that you have on your uh, left lapel there. 
my question has to do with uh, back home in my home district, Ellington Field. And the Coast Guard is considering, I understand, uh, purchasing about 10 acres out there and moving their facility, uh, the majority of their facility from the Houston Ship Channel over to Ellington. And I just wanted to get an update, if you can, please give us an update uh, on that plan to purchase the land and what can we do to help. Yes, sir. I, unfortunately, I can't, and it's not because I won't share the information. It's just not something that's directly under my purview. I, I know that there are plans underway uh, for various units down there uh, post-hurricane damage and relocations, and, and we'll be happy to provide something for the record. Um, I'll need to go into one of my other assistant commandant's directorates and get the information, but I understand the question about Ellington. Thank you very much for that. And, and again, anything you can do, anything we can do to help, if that makes the Coast Guard's operations in the greater Houston area more efficient, uh, we're going to be happy to do that. Uh, and I just want to commend the Coast Guard and the job you all did uh, during Hurricane Ike when it came through our region. Fantastic job. Uh, and I know the Coast Guard talking to the, the captain down there, they had a unique challenge that he hadn't anticipated, but about 2 in the morning got a call that the uh, USS Texas a uh, battleship from the uh, from actually the World War One area tried to do something she hadn't done in about 60 years, which was uh, float and get underway. And uh, an incredible challenge. The Coast Guard rose to it with the local uh, private sectors and kept her right there on the pier and prevented potentially prevented the Houston Ship Channel uh, from being shut down for an extended period. But uh, with the hurricane season ramping up here, the 2009 season, is there anything we can do in the acquisitions process to make sure that the Coast Guard is prepared uh, for hurricane strikes, disaster relief, and recovery? No, sir. I, th I think the committee, is, as evidenced by the uh, bill, is working on permitizing some of the authorities we have in acquisition. I think that you know your support in uh, authorizing uh, appropriate funding levels uh, so that we can recapitalize the Coast Guard is, is all we can expect and of course your continued oversight uh, and help with our acquisition programs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's all my questions. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Admiral. Thank you very much, Mr. Kagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Rear Admiral, for being here this morning to uh, answer our questions. Um, appreciate the work that you're doing. Appreciate your service. I represent and have the honor of representing the Marinette uh, Marine uh, Shipyards. And uh, first off, let me just ask you if you've ever doubted the quality of their work. No, sir. So their work is pretty high quality. Have you ever had in the Coast Guard any questions whatsoever about the pricing of their work or their quality? No, sir. I, within the Coast Guard, Marinette has an excellent reputation for the buoy tenders that they uh, constructed for us. And, of course, we have an ongoing project with them right now, Response Boat uh, Medium, and the second line is just starting to form up and uh, open in Green Bay uh, with the original line still out at uh, Quechek in Washington. Uh, but we look forward to that, and uh, Response Boat Medium has been a great boat. Isn't it true that following the uh, unhappy experience, some would say the debacle of the deep water experience, that the Coast Guard has been working very hard to, to address cost overruns and oversight? Isn't that true? Yes, sir. And, and given these facts, perhaps you could explain to this uh, committee why it is and on what basis the Coast Guard awarded the FRC, the Fast Response Cutter, contract to the highest bidder. It was a uh, best value competition, uh, so we considered, and again, the request for proposal, which we can provide for the committee, set the specific requirements of how we were going to fairly adjudicate the award. And it was based on technical expertise, uh, management ability, and price was the third and least important of the considerations. So we certainly did look at price compared to what the capability of what was, deliver what was being delivered would be, uh, but it was not based solely on what would be the cheapest product that the Coast Guard could buy. So there's a distinction then on manageability of the project, is that right? Yes, sir. Perhaps you can uh, not use my time, but provide for me in writing the differences in manageability, as you would call it. Any other uh, distinguishing uh, factors that made that award go somewhere else? No, sir. I appreciate looking. I'm looking forward to seeing that in writing. I thank you very much for being here today. <coughs> Yield back my time, unless, of course, Congressman Taylor would like my two minutes. I yield back my time. 
Just one other question. Thank you very much. Just one other question. Uh, the G oh, Ms. Richardson. Sorry. Did you want to go forward, Mr. Chairman? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, um, according to what I've read in our statement, the mission of your particular department is to provide the improvement of aids to navigation, shore facilities, vessels, and aircraft, including equipment related thereto, and the maintenance and the rehabilitation and lease of operation of facilities and equipment. My question is, um, since September 11th, the Coast Guard has taken on significant new homeland security missions, such as port security, in addition to your traditional missions. When I look at the summary of the acquisitions, it's only in Command 21 that there's a real um, reference, in, in my opinion, to those activities. Um, how would you view how you're approaching the port requirements that you have as well? Uh, well, first, so I don't think take credit for things that um, I actually don't do. I think that the definition you read would fit more our mission support organization. It includes acquisition, our engineering and logistics um, directorate, our C4SR directorate, and human resources. Those are all involved in the activities that you just said. Um, also, the, you know, the Coast Guard has been involved in security since 1790, so sometimes we even use the term traditional, non-traditional missions, but we've been doing security for a long time. The focus on security was not as great as it has become since 9-11, but all the projects we do are multi-mission in the sense that they can do maritime security, maritime safety, and national defense, and we make sure that the appropriateness of that it fits into each um, asset. You know, for example, a buoy tender probably has much more maritime safety capability than maritime security, but we do build in some maritime security capabilities, and, and the opposite might be true of a cutter that's typically used in law enforcement. But all the major access we're working on are capable of all three of those broad mission areas. So if that, in fact, is the case, if there's a fire on a cruise ship that's carrying a couple thousand people, or a cargo ship that's coming in. Do you have a dual responsibility with that? As far as fighting the fire or as far as taking the people off? Taking the people off. Uh, it is, it would be our responsibility along with other agencies to take the people off and we would mobilize any assets that we had available to do that. Okay. Have you made any evaluations of the larger ships now that are being utilized, whether it be from a cargo or a passenger perspective and determined what adjustments you may need to make in, term of, in terms of acquisitions? Uh, yes, ma'am, I believe so. If I could provide that for the record, that it is a different directorate that does our maritime inspection and marine safety activities. And I know I've, I'm privy to discussions we've had in larger meetings. I'm, it's not an area of my expertise. But I can certainly provide for you what we've done as far as contingency planning and regulations for cruise ships and, and other carriers like that. Okay, I would appreciate that information. And I'm sure the committee as well. My final question, I've only got two minutes here. Uh, the question on Rescue 21, the cost of Rescue 21 system has been revised five times since it was adopted in 1999. The cost of the system has quadrupled, rising from 250 million to 1 billion. In an analysis of the Rescue 21 conducted in 2006 by the GAO, they found that key factors contributed to this cost, um, much of which was management issues. At the time of the 2006 report, the GAO wrote that there have been reductions in the promised improvements to limit the communications gaps. Originally, Rescue 21 was intended to limit communication gaps to 2%. Now that target is less than 10%. What is the current target, and are you certain that it will be achieved? The current target is 90%, which would be the corollary of 10%. You are absolutely cor correct in stating that that requirement was changed. It was actually changed in 2001, so it was very early in the Rescue 21 program. But, but let me say exactly what that means. That means in any coverage area, there could be up to a 10% possibility in a particular area that you wouldn't receive the signal on the first time. That signal's based on a one watt signal at 20 miles at two meters over the water. Any handheld unit has both a one and a five watt setting. Any fixed unit in a boat transmits at at least 25 watts. So that 10% is based on one watt at two meters. 
Um, so I, th I think that requirement is actually much more robust than it sounds, because almost anybody's going to be transmitting at a higher wattage with the potential for a higher antenna. Um, but that is the standard, is 10 percent, based on one watt at two meters at 20 nautical miles. Well, then why did you originally move forward with the project to do it at 2 percent? Part of it was doing cost realism for what our requirements were, and we could do 2 percent, we can do 1 percent. Um, it just costs a lot more money in the sense of how many towers you have to put up, how high the towers have to be. I think in the last five years we've gotten cost realism on how difficult it is to put towers up in communities, the limits on heights of towers and the costs of towers making them higher. Um, and we felt this was a very reasonable standard given that it was based on one watt at two meters at 20 miles. We have documented cases now, for example, of picking up Rescue 21 signals at 200 nautical miles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Just one real quick question. One of the GAO's strongest uh, concerns uh, was that the personnel challenges at the Coast Guard specifically faces is the lack of an acquisition career path for military personnel. And you all like to have generalists, is that right? We like to have a mix. You like to have what? We like to have a mix, sir. We generally bring in uh, military personnel with operational experience and civilians that have spent most of their careers in acquisition or engineering. So we like to mix the two together because we think that's the best combination. And so what are we, what's being done to create a, a career path, though, within, within the service? Because that was one of their, their major concerns. Yes, sir, and it's one of ours, and we appreciate the GAO's recommendation. We do have the newest version of the Human Capital Plan out. One of the next steps on that, I, I will not call it a military career path in the same way the Navy means it. We have a quasi-career path that we'll introduce that will basically have a career guide if you're starting. I have ensigns and lieutenants that come up to me and say, I'm excited about acquisition. How do I get involved? So we'll explain to them what they need to do as a lieutenant, what kind of tours they need to ask for, what certification levels they need to go to, what they need to ask for maybe later on in their career as a lieutenant commander so that we can use them as a commander or captain as a deputy project manager or a project manager. We have about 19 commanders and captains now that are level three certified, the highest level with the right experience. And this will grow that workforce uh, so that we have more of them. We're also doing it in conjunction with our engineering communities. So my sister directorates are doing the same kind of quasi-career path for their personnel so that when engineers are out in an engineering tour, they get their acquisition certification while they're out there. Very well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Taylor, I'm just, just a follow-up and uh, just quickly. Admiral, who in, the, who in the Coast Guard, give me a name of your most qualified person in uniform to tell me what a ship should cost, what the national security cutter should cost, what the new PC should cost. Well, I, I would probably go with uh, the leader of our acquisition execution uh, subdirector. It now works for me, Admiral Ron Robigo is a naval engineer. Uh, commanded the yard in Baltimore, has a lot of hands-on experience with What's ship What's that construction. name again, sir? It's Ron, R-O-N, and the last name is Rabago, R-A-B-A-G-O, and he has been uh, directed to be my replacement this June, but uh, I, I would be more than happy to arrange a visit by him. He's, he's gotten his fingers dirty working in naval engineering, okay, so I think okay, he really well, understands it. Very quickly. How many hours would you estimate the Coast Guard trained you before they let you fly an aircraft? We go to Navy training and it lasts a year. Uh, we get about 90 hours stick time uh, back when I went through in T-28s. And then we would go to Coast Guard training and get about another 60 or 70 hours in helicopters if you're going the helicopter route. I'm just curious, how much time do you think that captain got, or that admiral got, as far as training for actual acquisition before he was placed in that position? Yes, sir. I, I'd be more than happy to provide that for the record and have him come up and meet with you. I think he's had extensive training. You know, we 
define acquisition as the defense acquisition university does, which is composed of 13 professions, which includes naval engineering, logistics, RDT&E, test and evaluation. Those are all part of acquisition. And he's had extensive experience. Again, we'd be pleased to provide that for the record. And, and I hope that we could arrange a visit. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. I would much. welcome that visit. Admiral Bloom, thank you very much. And we wish you the very, very best. We will now uh, welcome uh, Mr. John P. Hutton, Director of Acquisitions and Sourcing Management, United States Government Accountability Office. Welcome, uh, Mr. Hutton, and we'll hear from you now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, other members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss Coast Guard's acquisitions, specifically its Deepwater program, the largest acquisition in the Coast Guard's history. Deepwater represents almost 60 percent of the Coast Guard's 2009 budget for acquisition, construction, and infrastructure. To carry out this acquisition, the Coast Guard awarded a contract in June 2002 to Integrated Coast Guard Systems, a joint venture formed by two contractors, as a systems integrator. The systems integrator was responsible for designing, constructing, deploying, supporting, and integrating the assets. Five years later, after experiencing serious performance and management problems, and with assets in various stages of development, the Coast Guard Commandant acknowledged that it relied too heavily on contractors to do the work of the government. The Commandant announced several major change, changes to the acquisition approach to deep water. Today, drawn primarily on our June 2008 report, I would like to highlight several Coast Guard initiatives that are designed to improve the acquisitions, including increased accountability for deep water outcomes. But notwithstanding these initiatives, the Coast Guard continues to face risks and challenges in moving forward with its deep water program. I should also mention that we have related ongoing work for the Appropriations Committees and expect to issue a report later this year. First, the Coast Guard has developed a blueprint for acquisition reform that sets forth objectives and specific tasks aimed at improving acquisition processes and results across the Coast Guard. One key effort was the July 2007 consolidation of the Coast Guard's acquisition responsibilities, including the Deepwater Program, under a single acquisition directorate. We believe this effort has increased accountability for deep water, whereas in the past, deep water assets were managed independently of other Coast Guard acquisitions. Second, the Coast Guard is now managing deep water under an asset-based approach rather than as a systems, a systems approach, and this approach has resulted in increased government control and visibility over its acquisitions. For example, cost and schedule information is now captured at the asset level, resulting in the ability to track and report cost breaches. Also, the Coast Guard has begun to follow a more disciplined acquisition approach found in its major systems acquisition manual. This process requires documentation and approval of program activities at key points in a program's life cycle. Previously, the Coast Guard authorized the Deepwater Program to deviate from this structured acquisition process, stating that the requirements of the process was not appropriate for the systems of systems approach. The consequences of not following the structured approach in the past are now becoming apparent for some assets already in production, such as increased costs of the national security cutter. While certain cross-cutting aspects of deep water, such as C4ISR and numbers of each asset needed to meet requirements still require a systems level approach, the Coast Guard is not fully positioned to manage these aspects, but it's engaged in efforts to get there. We also reported in June 2008 that Deepwater, or excuse me, that DHS approval of Deepwater acquisition decisions was not technically required. The department had deferred decisions on specific assets to the Coast Guard in 2003. In response to our recommendation last year, the Under Secretary for Management rescinded that delegation of Deepwater Acquisition Decision Authority in September 2008, and the Deepwater program is now subject to the department's new acquisition review process. 
If implemented as intended, and I underscore that, if implemented as intended, the new process can help ensure that the Department's largest acquisitions, including Deepwater, are effectively overseen and managed. Third, like many federal agencies that acquire major systems, the Coast Guard faces challenges in recruiting and retaining a sufficient government acquisition workforce. Again, this is important because one of the reasons the Coast Guard originally contracted for a systems integrator was a recognition that it lacked the experience and depth in its workforce to manage the acquisition itself. The Coast Guard's 2008 Acquisition Human Capital Strategic Plan identifies a number of workforce challenges that pose the greatest threats to acquisition success, including the shortage of civilian acquisition staff. The Coast Guard has taken steps to hire more acquisition professionals, including increased use of recruitment incentives, relocation bonuses, uh, utilizing direct hire authority, and rehiring government annuitants. But the shortage of government acquisition workforce personnel means that the Coast Guard is relying on contractors to supplement the government staff, often in key positions such as cost estimators, contract specialists, and program management support. While support contractors can provide a variety of essential services, their use must be carefully overseen to ensure they do not perform inherently governmental roles. In closing, in response to significant problems under the Deepwater Program, the Coast Guard leadership has made a major change in course in its management oversight by reorganizing its acquisition directorate, moving away from the use of a contractor as lead system integrator, and putting in place a structured, more disciplined acquisition approach for Deepwater assets. While these initiatives are having a positive impact, the extent and duration of this impact depend on positive decisions that continue to increase and improve government management and oversight. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you very much. GAO stated in a recent report on deep water, and you reiterated this point in your written testimony, that, that one of the challenges that the Coast Guard faces is building its acquisitions dire directorate is a lack of an acquisition career path for military officers. You also wrote in your testimony that the service's three-year rotation policy for military members, quote, limits continuity in key project roles and can have a serious impact on the acqu acquisition expertise, but that the Coast Guard is seeking to improve the base of acquisition knowledge throughout the Coast Guard by exposing more officers to acquisition as they follow their regulation rotations. Can you comment on what the impact of the lack of an acquisition career path is on the Coast Guard's ability to attract the most capable officers to acquisition management and to retain them in the service? And is exposure through a three-year rotation adequate to build senior level acquisition expertise within the Coast Guard? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take that from uh, a couple different angles. First, um, it's clear that the Coast Guard does not have uh, sufficient numbers of military uh, officers or acquisition programs to uh, sustain a full-time acquisition career path. But you do point out uh, one interesting point that uh, about the three-year rotations. Uh, our work on the defense side, particularly for roles such as program managers, uh, when we compare it against best practices in the private sector, we found that the private sector has program managers that pretty much stay throughout the life of the program. DOD uh, typically, uh, I believe, wants to have their program managers in there a minimum of four years, but what's important is that the folks that do take those positions have had experience in, the, in a variety of acquisition um, uh, types of activities and that they also are supported by sufficient number of uh, trained uh, acquisition professionals as well, whether it be civilian or military. You know, I made a comment, and I just was wondering what your reaction to it was. I mean, I said that with our unemployment rate being what it is, it seems like we'd be able to find uh, civilians to who are already in acquisitions, by the way, and we're not buying a lot of things these days. So it seems to me that we would, they may, not, they may be in other areas, but it seems like we'd be able to find people who had the basics, things to look for, things to... Uh, to be aware of and be able to train them within a reasonable amount of time to do this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And two, I want to go back to something Mr. Taylor was alluding to, uh, and that is when he asked a question, and I paraphrase as best I can, are we training, are we, are we, does it seem like we're preparing folk for 
uh, was sort of overdoing it. In other words, from what you could see with regard to using the Navy, uh, and I don't know how much you got into that, uh, whether it would be better to n not worry so much about uh, creating a, a very strong acquisitions department and just kind of rely on other, uh, you know, like the Navy and others to help us out here uh, because we won't have this kind of acquisition but once in a century, as he said. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he said. Generation. 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 Sure. I think uh, in our work, uh, generally uh, looking at acquisition workforce, we have a report that uh, I think is coming out soon on the DOD acquisition workforce that I think will be interesting and instructive maybe as we talk about these issues here. But one of the things that we've looked at in terms of, say, the shortage of acquisition professionals across the federal government is that there's this reliance on uh, contractors to help support that. And in looking at it in that vein, I think one of the things that we're noticing is that, you know, the government still needs a basic uh, capacity. Uh, to, uh, I think that the Admiral might have mentioned organic capacity, but you need a basic capacity in the government for the variety of acquisition specialties so that you can assure yourself that you are getting good outcomes, whether you are building an acquisition force, trying to bring more government employees in, uh, whether you're perhaps relying on contractors because you don't have any short-term alternative. But for me, the question then becomes, what are you doing if you want to use government uh, people to build towards that total, um, you know, civilian uh, acquisition support. On that note, I was reading your um, report, and, it, and on page eight, you had talked about uh, one of the problems with regard, just piggybacking on what you just said, um, one of the problems with why, why you want to have your own people. And you said, you talked about the conflicts of interest when you contract out, that is. Conflicts of interest, improper use of personal service contracts, That's increased, correct. increased costs are also potential concerns of reliance on contractors. So those, those are other things that you're concerned about. Mr. Chairman, you are hitting the issues uh, that are real key if you are going to be using contractors for certain types of support ac acquisition support activities. Um, just to use an example, um, in some work we did over at DOD, we found that they were using contractors for contract specialist support. Um, the issue there was when you have a blended workforce and you have the contractors working side by side with government employees, you know, you do want to keep it separate. You don't want the government, if it's not a personal service contract, telling a contractor what to do. Their own people ought to be telling them what to do to perform the outcomes of the contract. But in that work, we did find that um, one of the issues was, and, and there's no magic number for this, but what does, the gov does the government have sufficient capacity to oversee and ensure that they're getting um, products that are in the government's best interest. And that requires trained personnel. I believe the DAU may have put out a notional 25% uh, for um, uh, contract specialists, meaning that you want to keep a government contractor re ratio no um, higher than, say, government of 75% or no lower than government 75% contract specialists, 25%. That's, that's just a number they put out. I don't have the right number, but I think what's key to this is when the government decides to use contractors for those types of activities, one, they have to know what they're asking the contractor to do. They have to understand it. They have to have people that are going to be taking that input from the contractor and understand that there may be, you know, I'm getting this from a contractor. I'm not getting it from a government employee, so therefore I have to be sure that I protect the government's interests when I think about the, uh, the information and make decisions on it. So it is very important that the government has a basic inherent capacity uh, in the acquisition workforce. There are several organizations that might prefer to have just government only. They may feel that per, in, in a per particular time they can't grow their workforce fast enough to do that. So to complete the mission, they might have to use contractors. Just last, last question. The, one of the things that, that bothers me tremendously is when we see a, a contract and then we see the cost overruns that, and it seems like this, oh, uh, this uh, President Obama is trying to get to this, but these cost overruns, I mean, you, you get up to a point where I, I'm sure there are situations in government where the cost overruns can actually be more than the original contract, which is crazy. 
I mean, we're approaching that in some instances. Um, I think I just mentioned one where it was started off at 250 million and ended up to be 1.1 billion. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to figure out, just take, help us through uh, what do we need to do? I mean, how does that relate to what we're talking about right now with regard to acquisitions? Sure, uh, I appreciate that because, question. Because we need to get the most bang for our buck. We already, this was a $24 billion program and you just heard the Admiral say we're up now to $26 billion at the rate we're going, but that probably really means about at least 34, probably, uh, at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you take it all the way out. And I'm just, and I, and I just don't want us to be in a situation where we are lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. Well, thank you. Um, you, re you remarked about the president's um, memorandum on uh, contracting, and I think the president mentioned a lot of the different things that our work has focused on and, and, and kind of talked about over, you know, a decade and beyond. Um, and it all has to do with the, the way government goes about uh, contracting for things. If I take it to the deep water as an example, um, I think um, oftentimes, uh, and also DOD, it gets back to requirements. You know, do we, do we know what we're buying? Do we have a good understanding of what we're buying? And do we basically try to um, hold to that requirement as best we can so that you can then carry through? There are situations in contracting where the government may not have uh, a clear understanding of what they're buying. They might feel, because of the urgency of the mission, they're going to go and say, for example, allow the contractor to proceed with uh, certain ceilings. Well, in those situations, the risk is on the government. And the faster the government can lock in to the requirements, the better it is for protecting the uh, taxpayer's interest. More specifically about deep water, what I think one of the major changes that you're seeing here from what perhaps uh, two years ago is that the, the Coast Guard is um, now um, committed and, and um, are, are planning on adhering to their um, major systems acquisition manual, which is a very disciplined process that requires um, clear documentation uh, from the standpoint of uh, operational requirements, acquisition program baselines, and, and the whole nine yards. Also, if, if they adhere to that process, and they also have um, uh, sufficient DHS uh, overview of the Coast Guard activities, then I think the government is, is, is in a better place than they were, say, three years ago. Three years ago, the Coast Guard bought a solution. They had a dollar value, but I, I don't think for each individual asset under that solution, they could probably really give you much insight into the cost and schedule of each of those assets. Now that they've taken it in-house and they're trying to apply this more disciplined approach, I think you're finding that there's some discovery going on and better understanding, better granularity into what they're actually buying. Thank you very much, Mr. Labiando. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to keep going on this uh, cost overrun issue just a little bit. And, as the chairman said, and as we've talked about, uh, the Coast Guard has experienced the, quite a few cost overruns. In your mind, is there, um, is there a single most dominating contributing factor to these cost overruns, uh, or is it, is it asset by asset, situation by situation? I think um, to date, uh, it's still a little early because they are, as I mentioned, starting to adhere to this process where they're going through this um, uh, exercise and getting the visibility on an asset basis versus a systems basis. For example, to get a cost breach on a $24 billion program, there's a lot of stuff that could be happening in the program and, and, and you really wouldn't understand it because it was all basically sitting on the, the uh, lead system integrator side. By, by looking at it asset by asset basis, to look at a 10, 20 percent cost breach, it's going to be much more visible, much more apparent sooner than it would have otherwise. So I think that's important uh, from the standpoint of, again, using a, a very disciplined process. Okay. So with what is, oh, I, with where we're going now. Go. I, I forgot the other part of your um, question, sir. Right. Um, I think for like the NSC increases, I believe it is in part 
because of the, um, you know, there's, there's economic factors for uh, materials and things like that. I think some of it had to do with um, uh, a little bit of the understanding the implications of some of the requirements changes early on and things of that nature. But I think as they s start looking at it on an asset by asset basis, they're going to be able to provide you all with more insights as to where they see those individual assets as it relates to cost schedule performance. So you feel if they're diligent with this new approach that that could prove to be very beneficial? Yes, I do think, um, you know, if they weren't applying that approach, I don't think some of these uh, specifics that you might be hearing about today, particularly I think uh, the Admiral or uh, maybe the Chairman mentioned these acquisition program baselines, um, uh, it's my understanding they, uh, they, they didn't have those on the individual assets per se. Um, they're working towards getting those acquisition program baselines. So what that's doing is just giving more visibility on the asset basis, insights into what they're buying and what's the cost and schedule implications. So I, th I think that's a good thing. But I do want to stress, as part of your oversight, um, I know uh, the Coast Guard programs are a big part of it, but we issued a report last November, and we looked at the entire DHS process for um, their acquisitions, uh, the review of acquisitions. We looked at over 40, 50 uh, systems, and we found that while they had a process, they weren't executing the process. We know that um, uh, some programs might have prepared an acquisition program baseline. It would go up to the DHS, and it would either take a long time to get approved or it would never get approved. So there wasn't a discipline in executing that broader DHS process. They made modifications to their process, um, and, and they've made some improvements. But my question is, and I think it's a good oversight question for this committee, is when the Coast Guard prepares these documentations that we've been talking about, and they have to provide them to DHS, does DHS have the, the resources to ensure that they're giving those Coast Guard programs good scrubs and getting the, a timely response back to the Coast Guard to keep these acquisitions on track? I, I personally think, um, you know, looking at the broader DHS acquisition review process is, is, is a piece of this, because that's going to give you some added um, insight into what's going on at a component level. Okay. So you're taking it out of the yeah, component. That's, that's good. Thanks. Uh, under Deepwater, the lead system integrator has selected command and control systems that include proprietary software under the control of one of the prime contractors. How do you think this impacts the Coast Guard's ability to modify and add new components to the uh, systems installed uh, aboard Deepwater assets? Mm -hmm. I think you're hitting on a very important issue here. Uh, we were talking about C4ISR earlier, and I think um, uh, Mr. Larson had raised the question about um, you know, where the Coast Guard was versus where we were. Um, we're currently looking at the C4ISR as an update to, the, to our work last year, but what I wanted to say was that the Coast Guard, um, you know, they're still looking and analyzing at what they bought from uh, the lead systems integrator, integrator to date for a C4ISR solution. Um, you know, so, so I don't think they're quite there yet. They're looking at it, um, uh, but when you bring into the issue of the proprietary data proprietary rights. I think that's a very key issue, and um, I don't recall the current status, but we're looking at that issue as part of our ongoing work right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hutton, I'm, I'm curious, who in the GAO can tell us what either an LCS or a national security cutter should cost? Um, Do you have a name? Well, sir, um, we can tell you what the Coast Guard um, says. It's their current estimate of what it costs. Um, I, GA, I can't give you, GAO doesn't have an independent uh, estimate of that. I uh, believe the Coast Guard is using um, third party entities to help do some of this independent cost estimating, but we don't have a, a GAO estimate on that. I'm just curious, how do, how do you determine that someone else isn't getting a bargain if you don't really know what something should cost? Well, we take a look at the, uh, the, the I approach. I know you're looking at processes, and, and, yes, and I very much yeah. agree with you about the conflict of interest. Private sector's job is to make money. Ours is just the opposite. Right. Ours is to get the best value for the taxpayer, and yes. so I, I yes, appreciate sir. that. Who, and again, I'm trying to understand. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm frustrated both with the 123 program and the LCS program. 
So all this is very real. Does anyone in the GAO go to either the Coast Guard and the Navy and say, price of aluminum is half of what it was two years ago. Price of steel is half of what it was two years ago. Price of titanium is down a third from two years ago. What are you guys doing to get a better deal for the taxpayer? Did, is, is that your function? Mm -hmm. um, those are very detailed, specific questions that's drilling down into a particular asset. We have not been at that level for this program. I know that the uh, IG previously had done some work looking at the NSC as a particular platform. We did look at the overall process and the government's ability to um, you know, manage the acquisition, but I don't, I don't have that detail, sir. <clears throat> okay, so uh, unless you are tasked by either Congress or the administration, you don't voluntarily look over another agency's shoulder and say you can do better. Is that correct? Generally, I think that's the uh, that's our protocols. But but I might add, Mr. Taylor, um, you know, for example, on the fast response uh, boat that they just awarded a contract, it's my understanding that's a fixed price contract, and so um, uh, you know, it, and with with competition, you know, the principles are that hopefully the government's getting a uh, a good price. But I think versus the NSC. In the previous ships, it was handled by the um, systems integrator, and I think that was one of the issues we were pointing out early on was the extent to which um, the government could ensure that there's sufficient competition on these assets. So by bringing it in-house and doing their own, I think there's um, uh, an opportunity to, to, to rely on market forces to a greater extent than they may have in the past. Did your team visit Bollinger Shipbuilding? I believe so. Did we? No? For this current work? Uh, for this current work that we're doing right now, no, sir. I, I am told that there are unused equipment packages for the 123s that were not converted still sitting there. I don't know it for a fact because I haven't stepped foot on Bollinger's property, but who in your organization could determine that that is the case and who in your organization would say, Let's find another good use for them because the taxpayers have already paid for them. Mm -hmm. sir, is that's, that your job, or do sir, you have to be tasked to do that? That is something that um, we could look at as part of our uh, work right now and ask that very uh, question that you're asking. But I don't, I don't believe we have an answer to that right now. Okay, but, but, but I want to go back to this because it, uh, it, it troubles me that it, it seems like every time the price of materials go up, Someone who's representing, someone who does business with the government pays a visit on my office and says, we need more money. I'm particularly troubled when the price of aluminum tanks, the price of steel tanks, the price of titanium tanks, every vendor in America is looking for work. No one is walking through my door saying, we can make you a better deal. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find the agency and the government that ought to be tracking those things and telling Congress, you ought to be getting a better deal. Mm -hmm. Are you that agency? Or, or I, do I we believe, have to task someone else to do that? Well, I believe that um, agencies can um, uh, perhaps solicit some support from, say, an, an, an institution like the Defense Contract Management Agency. I know that they may have people in the uh, plants, or they may look at uh, some of those issues that you're uh, referring to. But it's not you? We have not, in our current work, been at that level, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Olson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hutton, thank you for coming today to testify and for providing us with some of your insights to the problems and the solutions uh, to the Coast Guard's acquisition process. Uh, I'd like to talk about the use of uh, contract personnel in the acquisition process. And in your report, you highlighted um, several positive steps the Coast Guard has taken to increase the transparency and the accountability of the acquisitions process, and particularly the use of contract personnel. And you do remain concerned with that. If I understood a comment you made earlier, uh, right now the Coast Guard has about 25 percent our contract personnel, and you mentioned earlier about 25 percent may be a good limit for that. And so my question is, uh, what are the risks associated with using contract personnel to support federal acquisitions, and how, what can the Coast Guard continue to do to reduce those risks? Mm -hmm. I think the greatest risk is if the government is uh, having a contract to support an acquisition and they haven't paused for a moment to think about, hey, we're using a contractor, say, to write a statement of work. 
there's an implication to that, I think, in terms of a government interest. And that brings it back to the question of, you know, um, it, it's not that you can't use contractors. I mean, it's not forbidden, but it puts a higher, in my mind, premium on the government's capacity to understand what the implications are, and so that when they look at the um, input, say, from the contractors, they're thinking about it as a taxpayer and thinking about, um, you know, uh, and understanding what they have so that they can make the best decision, you know, basically to protect the, uh, the taxpayer's interests. So I think that's one of the key um, instances. I think if they feel like in the short term they have to use a contractor, my immediately thought would be, okay, if you don't want to land there two years from now, you want to be in a different place, what are you doing to get there? You know, have you developed a strategy? What specific skills do you need? Where do you think you're going to get them? How are you going to grow them? I mean, there's, there's a lot of human capital aspects to it. So it's not so much perhaps, um, you know, that, I mean, I don't know right now the, where the government is. Um, I'm not sure how they'd accomplish a lot of their missions without, say, for example, some support of the contractors. But what would worry me is if they weren't considering the inherent risks and um, having the skilled people in the chain from the government side that's going to ensure that um, taxpayers' interests are protected. Thank you for that answer. Are there any additional oversight mechanisms that you suggest to ensure that contractors are not inappropriately performing inherently government roles? No, I like to, I think it just takes it back to the, you know, who's seeking, um, who has the requirement and how are they fulfilling that requirement? And if they are using a contractor, I think at that level, that's where the, the, true, the deepest understanding should be as to you know, what are the potential ramifications for it and how are we going to mitigate any risks that we might have talked about earlier, whether it be conflicts or um, you know, is it going to cost more, is it going to cost less? Well, we have to get the mission if it costs more, but then maybe that's not where we want to be long term. So what is our strategy to move from there? So I kind of see it as that that decision point is really the important part. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Yield back my time. Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Hutton, back to C4ISR, and uh, uh, can you hear Admiral Bloor and read your report? Um, do you have a uh, – can you review your response to what the Admiral testified mm -hmm. to? Sure. I think that, as we said in our June 08 report, and you think about it right now, I think the Coast Guard is still trying to uh, determine uh, and analyze what it is that they're getting from the, um, originally getting from the lead systems integrator, you know, what, what's all involved in that. Um, I do think it's a very positive step that um, not only in the area of C4ISR, but also uh, engineering that the Coast Guard now has um, technical authority over those issues. Previously, they didn't. If, if someone in the Coast Guard uh, perhaps had some questions to raise about the C4ISR under the previous scenario, I'm not sure the person had much authority to do anything. By instilling the authority, the technical authority in those types of functions is a big step. And of course, like anything else, uh, that's only part of it. It's in the execution. But I do think that they are still in some discovery of understanding what it is they're getting. They have to think about how they're going to uh, connect all these different uh, assets. They got to think about the space requirements on the assets for these types of um, systems. Do you think this approach to an uh, asset by asset approach for the platform combined with, call it an umbrella approach to the C4 ISR acquisition is a, a better approach? Well, I think what um, because that, that's the end state they're headed mm -hmm. towards. You think that's mm -hmm. appropriate? Yeah, I, th I think the assets are hopefully, if you have a, a, a firmly defined operational requirement, and you're taking that back to a mission need, and you have all these different assets. That connection is important, but what's bridging across is this connection of the command control, communication computers. Um, uh, the C4 ISR type things. So you have to kind of look at that holistically. So I think um, they're thinking about it in a way that I, I, I think is a good approach. I think it's not an easy uh, solution and they have to work it hard, but I think that um, that's, they're potentially in a better place than they were before. In, I'm intrigued by uh, page five, the headline there, consequences of prior deep water acquisition approach may be costly. 
I think the committee's concluded it, it is costly, but um, I understand GAO's uh, approach. Um, and this uh, first uh, couple, actually it's the first sentence, ends with uh, um, basically the problems of the past are likely to pose continued problems such as increased costs. Has GAO done kind of an out-year assessment of what, what the legacy costs of the legacy problems of the deep water program are going to, going to be? I, I kind of view that as, a, as, as almost like the question the Admiral was getting. You know, right now we're looking at $26 billion, I think, was the figure right. tossed out here. Is that what it's going to be? And I think what you, you've asked that similar question in a different way. Um, from my point of view, say three years ago, I don't think that the Coast Guard would have as much insight into what it's going to cost for the different assets uh, than they do now, only because they are committed to apply their new discipline approach, which requires them to do these basic documents. Some of the assets that, that are out there that they're buying right now, they're still planning on going back and doing some of these documents because I think it's important to understand for that particular asset how it's going to fit in in the mix uh, in the future. So I think that um, um, right now we have some ongoing work looking at where some of the different assets are. Uh, we plan to report out in, in the uh, summertime, but I think you'll find that it's, it's really about almost discovery because they're, apply, they're applying this new discipline approach and they're going to get more insights okay. as they move along. Well, and, and I ask that question not to dig up the sins of the past because uh, you know over the last couple of years we know that the Coast Guard is making the changes that we have um, so, some folks have implored them to make uh, to the deep water acquisition program, but I, I also think it's if we can get some level of estimate on the on the, the costs of those mistakes, it might help us move on in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Provide some discipline, maybe some lessons for for uh, for other uh, agencies. Uh, finally. Um, uh, Finally, I'll make this quick here. In 08, you recommended that DHS rescind the Coast Guard's acquisition decision authority. It's since taken place. Um, but now, of course, that means that uh, Homeland Security has decision authority as opposed to the Coast Guard. Uh, in a recent report, you criticized Homeland Security's ability to oversee major acquisition programs. Um, so is DHL, DHS itself adequately equipped to oversee the Coast Guard's acquisition programs? Yeah. That's at the crux of what I was speaking to earlier, sir. Um, when I talked about the fact that in the past, whether you're the Coast Guard or any other component, the DHS at the departmental level did not have a, um, a well-executed review board process for investments across. I mean, we have billions of dollars across the DHS. Um, we felt that was important and we recognized, we had the ongoing work that there was some um, uh, a lack of execution of this acquisition review process, but we felt it was important that there be someone outside of the component that's looking at um, the questions, the, 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 looking at the cost estimates, looking at the plans and really asking the, the, the real hard questions perhaps from outside the component to apply some uh, perhaps some additional pressures insight to do the right thing. And um, my only concern right now, while the DHS has come out with a new directive, I think it's improved. I think they're providing more consistent guidance across the components. It's given them more insights as to what we want to see in an acquisition program baseline, what do we want to see in a test evaluation master plan, things like that. I think that's all good. My little worry is that if these components have to provide these documentations and get it through the DHS for departmental review, does the department have the capacity to execute their process? In the past, that was what the problem was. They weren't executing their process. They didn't have sufficient staff. Right now, it's my understanding that um, they believe they need to be around 56 staff to help manage and run this acquisition route review process and I don't believe at the moment they have even half that. So I just think that if, again, as I uh, mentioned to the chairman earlier, I think this is one particular in area that as part of your oversight of Coast Guard, it'd be interesting to know how is that working, the Coast Guard, when you're prepare preparing these acquisition program baselines, are you getting them returned in a reasonable amount of time or are they delaying you? you know, are you getting that kind of support? 
All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess, that, and I apologize if that was asked before, I guess that the lesson there is that in the future when we're looking at this, let's be sure we're um, asking the right agency the right question. If, 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 this, if this doesn't work, it may not be the Coast Guard's fault, it may be DHS's fault. And just need to be sure we're, we're pointing the finger in the right place and getting the right answers from the right folks. Ms. Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm catching a cold sitting waiting here. <laughs> Mr. Hutton, uh, let me just briefly ask you a question. You know, Mr. Chairman, I would find it really interesting if I've, I've only been here less than two years. I think it would be particularly helpful when we're operating, I think, in more of an oversight perspective to have, for example, the Rear Admiral stay to hear these comments so we could maybe one day get at making some headway instead of he testifies, you testify. I'm sure he has staff here, but I think there should be an ownership, particularly if we're in response to a problem that occurred, uh, that the Admiral, out of all due respect to him and his schedule, we've all got busy schedules, I think it might be kind of intriguing to actually have people, you know, stay and hear the testimony. I think um, so. As a matter of fact, it's amazing you said that. I thought about the same thing. Yeah, because um, with these comments. And, to further build upon that, Mr. Hutton, is there anything that you heard in the testimony that the Rear Admiral presented that you'd like to share a different perspective that you think this committee should know? Uh, no, ma'am. I think that um, the Admiral highlighted a lot of the things that we independently believe are good steps as well. Um, I've been mentioning this uh, adherence to their new discipline process. I think that's a huge thing. Uh, they weren't doing that before. They're doing it for the other systems, but not the uh, deep water. I think their consolidation of the acquisition function is a, a big step because now they're going to be able to leverage their uh, resources across all their acquisitions. They have a chief acquisition official that's going to be able to provide that oversight across the uh, Coast Guard. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think their use of third-party independent analyses is another good thing. That's a way to augment perhaps some um, specialties that you need to help provide the proper oversight, although we do mention in our statement that uh, human capital is a, a, a big area. So I think, um, for example, even their blueprint, the, the, the Admiral mentioned blueprint for acquisition reform. What I thought was key about that is they used heavily GAO's framework for assessing, for agencies' ability to assess their own acquisition workforce. And we think that's a good thing. They looked at their organizational alignment and the leadership. They looked at their human capital needs, they looked at their policies and processes, and they looked at the knowledge and information management they need to manage their acquisitions. I just think that structured approach they took that's in line with a lot of what we see are some of the best um, approaches for an agency to independently assess themselves are all positive things. So I think they're taking steps. The thing that I, I think we need to, to keep watch watching for is the execution and the continued leadership and the continued pressing to, to do the right thing. And I, I do think at the moment they have make, made great strides. Yes, they're getting more insights into their acquisitions, but I do think that they're, they're definitely, it's a change in course and they're heading in the right direction. One other question. The Commandant is quoted in the Coast Guard's blueprint for acquisition reform as stating that the Coast Guard must become the model for mid-sized federal agency acquisition and process workforce and capability. I want you to comment on how the Coast Guard's acquisition processes, workforce and current capabilities compare to the mid-sized agencies. Um, are there any best practices from other mid-sized agencies that are not currently being implemented by the Coast Guard's acquisition di directorate, and are there specific actions recommended in the blueprint that the Coast Guard is not yet implementing? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. It's hard for me to compare the Coast Guard's um, acquisition structure, say, to another midsize uh, organization. I just don't have that kind of uh, um, insight. Uh, across the government like that. Uh, as I mentioned to uh, Ms. Richardson, um, the fact that they used the, the framework that we've put out there for agencies to, to make an assessment about their acquisition function is a, a, a good thing. When you asked about the key steps remaining, in my mind, one is to continue to build and maintain that um, uh, acquisition workforce. 
I think that's part of the human capital piece of the uh, framework that I mentioned. I think that they need to continue bringing all their assets into compliance with the, uh, the major systems acquisition manual. Um, I do think, and this is a departmental level issue as well, but this making sure that they're aligning the budget to the acquisition process, that's another key piece. And um, I think their uh, blueprint also mentioned that they would be conducting uh, internal control reviews, and I just think that's uh, a good practice as well. Any others for someone beyond that? Well, thank you very much. Um, check there, there are other reports forthcoming. Yes, sir. Um, we expect sometime this uh, summer to issue a report that's going to basically our June 08 report, we've jumped off from the issues that we developed in that report, and we're just taking them further down the road uh, as, as the program evolves, and we hope to provide a, uh, some additional information I think will be very useful to this committee in conducting our oversight. Your comments about DHS should um, concern, concern all of us because it seems as if uh, if you don't have uh, folk if, you, if, they, if they are supposed to be sort of overseeing these types of things and they're not doing it, that's a, that's a major problem, isn't it? Yes, sir. Um, and I do point out that even in the last year and a half, you've seen um, some pretty big steps in terms of trying to get that uh, departmental review process um, uh, on firmer footing. I mean, this new directive isn't a small piece. I mean, it required a lot of interaction across all the components. The components have different language. They're in different places, different experiences. They buy different things. But I do think that was a huge step in coming out with this uh, directive. My only worry, again, is, and, and, and this is just because I'm an accountability organization, is that, um, you know, are they going to have the capacity to execute that new process because the capacity, I think, was one of the reasons why the, the, the other acquisition review process didn't work. So I, I, to me, in my mind, that's the key. <clears throat> I, I just don't want us to, as a, as a committee, to sit here and to hear this kind of testimony. And um, I mean, it seems that we would, we would almost have to get something to, I'm sure they already know this, what you're saying. Well, we should report in November that laid this out. We'll be happy to get that report to whoever you'd like on the committee. Um, again, the Coast Co or the uh, department has come out with that directive. It's not a small deal, but I'm just kind of looking forward because they had a process before, but it wasn't being executed. So my question is, you know, let's make sh sure that we can position ourselves at the departmental level to execute this process the way it's designed. So you're saying that the, the plan is great. I mean, it's nice. It's okay. Well, it's yes. I think that what they've done is a good thing in terms uh -huh. of this new directive, and okay. I think it's providing better guidance to the components. So it's a more systematic process. My only little uh, concern, and I think it's just a matter of time because this just came out just before the holidays. Uh, I think it was in November. November. Yeah. Yeah. Does DHS right now have the people they need to manage that process, and if not? Do they have a plan to get there, and is that a good plan? I, I would, that would be my area of interest. Well, one of the things I've often said is that a lot of times we, we kind of fool ourselves in, in government, and we say when the rubber meets the road, everything's going to be fine. And then when it comes time for the rubber to meet the road, we discover there is no road. And so I just want to make sure, I, I, in other words, I, I'm thinking about maybe getting a letter off to uh, the president or somebody, uh, the head of uh, Mr. Napolitano, uh, just reiterating some of the things that you've said here today. And that, you know, that it sounds like we've got a good plan, but we are we're concerned about making sure that there are, you know, requisite personnel to carry out the plan. The yes. plan is, means nothing if you're not carrying it out. And I, and I, I mean, did you have anything on that, Mr. Bobby, I know. No, I, th I think you're, you're right on the mark, and if, if DHS doesn't have the personnel or isn't interested in keeping an eye on this, then <laughs> the Coast Guard's uh, 
got a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. From my standpoint, sir, you know, uh, being an objective, nonpartisan organization, and I'm just looking at it from the standpoint of a taxpayer. Right. I do think, you know, the report laid out some problems over the last several years uh, in terms of the departmental over oversight. We do acknowledge that they came out with a new uh, directive, which we aren't basically um, raising real concerns about. We think it follows a lot of the good best practices and things like that. Um, but just looking forward, we can't say today, but it's just like a word of caution that I just wanted to put out there for um, this committee to think about, because I think that's an important piece of work we issued in November. Very well. Anything else, Mr. Lerman? Thank you very much. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned.